Well, good morning, good morning, and happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers that are here. Uh, we are super excited uh, for the opportunity to open God's Word with you uh, on Mother's Day. And um, I did this the first service, I'll do it this one too, although she's uh, not here, this one. I just want to uh, congratulate my wife and give her a very special Mother's Day shout out on our very first Mother's Day together celebrating the birth of our daughter. So, yeah. Don't let anyone tell you that God isn't still in the miracle working business. We wake up to a miracle every single day. And to my mom, Lillian Brown, happy Mother's Day, mom. Uh, I'm certain that she is watching. Okay, today I get the uh, joy of ending our series, Funny How Faith Works. Have you enjoyed this series? Can you make some noise? Huh? Has it not been good? So let's see, message one, we talked about Gideon and how God reduced his army and he took on 100,000 with just 300 people. Uh, the next message was about the widow with oil and how God showed her miraculous provision uh, in the midst of a great debt that she could not pay. And then how about Elijah, uh, God showing some great leadership with him, uh, calling down fire from heaven. And then we had Joshua fitting the battle of Jericho and the wall coming down. And then last week we had Jehoshaphat and this amazing choir that went before the warriors uh, and they didn't even have to fight. And then today, we're going to talk about a woman, an African woman, uh, and her decisive action she takes to save not only her husband, but her people, and her name is Zipporah. All right, so Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 through 26 is where you'll find my assignment this morning. Exodus 4, verses 24 through 26. This is how my Bible reads. It says, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. That's not a typo. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Uh, just briefly for a moment in our exchange together this morning, I want to speak to our hearts from the subject, when God sends a woman to the rescue. When God sends a woman to the rescue. But before I do, let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord shall indeed stand. God, it's my prayer that your word will stand mightily in me, that your word will stand mightily in this place and in our community and in this world we need you now. God, as I always ask that you would lift every burden, loose every chain, bind every distressing spirit, and destroy every yoke. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, for you get glory in this place. The people of God said together, amen. Uh, lately, my sister has been sending uh, my family uh, some very funny videos. And each of these videos contain uh, her toddler baby girl doing something uh, that is hilarious for now. So in these videos, my sister is asking her a series of questions and even at times giving her a series of instructions. And to every single response, it's two striking words, no mommy. She'll ask her, uh, that's a no touch. Uh, didn't mommy say, don't touch that baby? And she says, no, mommy. And then she says, this is my food. This is your food. I want you to eat your food. Don't you want your food? No, mommy. Or how about this one? Uh, baby, don't you want to be mommy sweet girl? Aren't you mommy sweet girl? And she says, no, mommy. And although this is sort of funny now, we all know that at some point, this will have to stop. Because in Christ, the goal is to not raise children. The goal is to raise adults. Adults that understand the word. Adults that understand how to pray. Ad adults that understand how to obey God and how to fear and reverence him. And this is the barrier for some 
of us as it pertains to having a truly fruitful relationship with God. Here it is. Our parents allowed us to do things that God does not. So we've grown up as immature adults expecting our our heavenly father to be like our earthly one. And Moses in chapter four is having one of those moments. But here comes Zipporah, his wife, to the rescue. To give you a little bit of biblical background here, Moses is chosen as God's man to deliver uh, Israel out of Egyptian captivity. But Moses in the preceding verses of chapter 4 has a a series of rebuttals that he uh, begins to present to God's plan. His biggest refusal being the fact that he stutters and he is told to go speak. And God begins to give him a series of signs. He tells him, uh, Moses, well, put down your rod. And Moses puts down his rod and the rod turns to a snake. And then he tells Moses, Moses, pick up the snake by its tail. He picks the snake up by its tail and it turns to a rod again. Now, remember, the title of this series is It's Funny How Faith Works. What's so funny about that? Everyone knows you do not pick up a snake by its tail. But these are the instructions that God gives Moses because he often requires unusual uh, tasks that have extraordinary outcomes. Then if that isn't enough, he tells him, uh, Moses, put your hand inside of your garment. He obeys. He puts his hand inside of his garment. He says, now pull it out. And when he pulls it out, his hand is completely leprous. He says, okay, put your hand back inside. He puts it back inside and he pulls it out and then his hand is healed. You see, this biblically has a very important significance because God is not so subtly hinting at Moses potentially being cut off because God is holy and he cannot have fellowship with anything unclean. You see, God is saying to Moses what I believe he's saying to you and I this morning. He's saying that he's not just the God of what's around you. He's also the God of what's on the inside of you. You see, aren't we at times just like Moses? We as Christians, we're able to clearly articulate where everyone else needs to be more aware of God's sovereign rule. We're able to clearly articulate to other people uh, 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 what the Bible says about things like gender identity and marriage and worship and how they should do their finances. But it seems to me that some of us seem to fail to realize that God is not just sovereign over our community in the world around us. God is also sovereign over us as well. Can you say amen? Moses is tripping. He's not realizing that God is also sovereign over him. Here's the big problem in this text. You never want to get used to telling God no. You never want to get used to telling God no. See, Moses has gone several times at this point, essentially telling God no. Here it is in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. He says, for they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. But wait a minute, Moses. They may say, this is the God who told you to put down a rod and it turned to a snake. This is the God who told you to put your hand inside your garment and pulled it out and it was leprous. And then you put it in and pulled it out and it was healed again. And you are worried about words? He says, for they may say the Lord has not appeared to you. You know, in my Christian walk, there are two things that God did in my life that completely radicalized and transformed my relationship with him. One is when I went from a, a just a local church worldview to a kingdom worldview. Here's what I mean by that. When the Lord allowed me to minister in Chile, Paraguay, Bolivia, Peru, Honduras, Jordan, Turkey, Dominican Republic, Ghana, and England, he, he, he took me out of this place where I was always concerned with local church stuff, voting and fighting over the colors of the carpet and the courage 
garden and, and all of these kind of things. And then once I traveled and once I saw the kingdom on a different uh, scale, then I really understood that the central need of mankind is the gospel of Jesus Christ and nothing else will do. It's the difference in being so, so, it, it, some of us cannot see the forest for staring at the trees. And I'm so glad that God gave me a king more of you. And here's the second thing he did for me. He freed me from the opinions of man. I ought to have a PhD and don't care. Here's why. It's not because I'm confident. It's not because I'm arrogant. Here it is. It's because I fear and reverence and respect God more than I do the words of people. I, I, re, I reverence him and I have a, a fear for him and I care about what he says, not what you say. I care about what his word says, not what you say. And Moses is saying in verse 1, for they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. In verse 10, he says, please, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Moses is saying, man, you gave me a speaking part, and I don't speak so well. Can I tell you something about being used by God to do a work? Where your limitations begin, God's enablement kicks in. Where your limitations begin, God's enablement kicks in. He's designed it that way. And in verse 14, the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. And that's never a verse that you want your name to be there. You, you don't want the anger of the Lord to be aroused against you. And Aaron is chosen as a substitute because he can speak. But watch this. This alternate spokesperson would one day make a golden calf, which is an idol. No one else can do for you what God has called you to do. This is a terrible substitute. Maybe, just maybe, God is right always. You see, some of us are limited in our walk with Christ because we always find a way to make a spiritual decision a natural one. And for many of us that have master's degrees and you come out of the corporate world and the business world, this does not make sense to you. Because the way that you make decisions in your life, you look for a certain skill set. But just because a person has a certain skill set, it does not mean that that's God's chosen person. And here we see that Aaron is a terrible alternate because he ends up making an idol. No one else can do for you what God has called you to do. See, a lot of us feel like as long as I tell them yes on the big stuff, then it's okay. You see, what happens is this mindset begins to creep in because we're under grace and mercy. What do I mean by that? You know what it's like to tell God no and not die. You know what it's like to tell him no, and he didn't kill your firstborn son. You know what it's like to tell him no, and he didn't strike your body with an illness. You know what it's like to know, to tell him no, and he didn't take your life. And here's the danger. Watch this. We begin to mistake God's grace and mercy for his approval and permission. You never want to get used to telling God no. See, Moses has a tendency to resist the call of God, but he doesn't understand that it has consequences. You see, what did Moses do that was so bad? Well, not only that, he failed to conform to the Abrahamic covenant requirements of circumcision. In Genesis 17 and 14, it teaches us that not obeying circumcision would be reason to be cut off from God's holy people. So because Moses was disobedient, his life is on the line. And not just his life, every single person connected to him. 
Now, I want to be clear about something. We, we don't have to bash men in order to celebrate women. That, that is not what this is about, okay? But fellas, every single thing we do affects those that are around us. And this is not to bash you. I want to tell you right now, I run my house. Oh, yes, I do. I run the dishwasher. I run the vacuum cleaner. I run the, the coffee maker. I mean, I run my house, okay? So we're not bashing you this morning, but I need you to understand that the implications of our actions, they affect so many more people than us. You see, because Moses was disobedient, his life was on the line. And I want to tell you now, some scholars cannot accept this. I had to phone a couple of friends this week because some people you read, they just cannot accept the fact that God was really this angry with Moses. You see, some of us feel that the call on the life of Moses was too big for God to just kill him. But here's what I need to say to us this morning. There's only one person who is irreplaceable, and his name is Jesus. Zipporah saved her husband by saying, and doing the right thing with the right heart. Through performing the action of circumcision and pronouncing it over Moses, the blessing of God is retained by Moses and his family. And here's why this is so important. Covenant signs express covenant promises to covenant people. Covenant signs express covenant promises to covenant people. So here's what Moses is leaving on the table. He's leaving on the table the fact that this meant personal transformation. It meant family prosperity. It meant spiritual security and territorial possession. Moses is willing to gamble away, not just for him, but for all the people he's supposed to lead out of captivity, personal transformation, family prosperity, spiritual security, and territorial possession. Here it is. Here's the good news for us this morning. Zipporah understands that God relents if people repent. That's the good news for you and I this morning. It doesn't matter. The Bible says that a righteous man falls seven times and he gets back up again. God is so loving and God is so gracious to you and I. And God relents if people repent. If we were to look back over our lives today and be honest with ourselves that that the grace of God is acting upon our lives like the waves upon the sea of the shore, of the sands of the sea of the shore. God washes over us over and over and over again. He gives us chances. He gives us opportunities. If God's people repent, God relents. He said, if my people will call by my name, would turn from their wicked ways, humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. As the musicians come, here's a question. How do we repent this morning? Here's what Zipporah understands. She teaches us that it's through right actions, right words, with the right heart. There it is. It's right actions and right words with the right heart. What she teaches us is that it's it's not enough to just do the right things. It's not enough to just say the right things. But God is also concerned with the heart in which we do the right actions and the right words. Let me ask you this morning, where in your life Have you begun to get used to simply telling God no? You know, it's one thing that's interesting about um, Moses is that he makes this excuse and he says that he can't speak and that he's slow of speech and he's slow of tongue and I've never been eloquent in the past nor in the future. 
And then if you go on to Acts, you'll see Stephen talk about Moses and how he's a powerful speaker with his words. You know, I wonder today, where have we gotten used to telling God no? Where have we given him rebuttals to say there's someone better than me? There's someone more educated than me? There's someone with a better skill set than me? There's someone better than me? No one else can do for you what God has called you to do. So this morning, may we repent with right actions, right words, and right deeds. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you now. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the gift of your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you for the ability to repent, the ability to come before your throne, the ability to come before you and simply say, we're sorry for the things that we've done. Now, Father, we ask that you reveal to us, every single person here, Uh, where we've essentially told you no, where we've given you rebuttals. There are many of us here today who, there are certain areas in our life we've just simply closed off from you. We'll make you Lord over here, but no, 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 don't come in this room. This is my space over here. So Father, we repent of places where we've closed the door and where we've offered rebuttals and where we have not obeyed. And God, we lay a hold of your covenant signs, your covenant promises for us as covenant people. And dear Lord, for the women in our lives that have discerned where we have been blind, they've seen where we have not seen. God, we celebrate them and we thank you for them and for all that they are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.